Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joseph Eglich, Deputy Chief Economist in ADB's Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to today's session where we'll hear from the winners of the inaugural ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Awards. So let's just jump right in. Um, to start, I would like to invite my colleague Ramesh Subramaniam, the Director General of the Southeast Asia Department here at ADB, uh, to give the opening remarks on behalf of ADB. Ramesh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. Uh, good evening. I see many of the speakers, including Professor Kaushik Basu, as well as the distinguished scholars will be speaking. They are um, joining from outside of the Asian time zone. So very good to have all of you. Uh, other participants, uh, good morning, good evening, depending on wherever you may be joining. Let me begin by sharing a brief background of the um, Asian Development Bank International Economic Association Award, um, as well as uh, by way of giving background as well as its objectives. It was in July 2021, uh, height of the pandemic, uh, ADB President uh, Masa Sakawa launched the joint ADB IEA uh, Innovative Policy Research Award during the opening panel on Asian and global policy issues at the IEA World Congress. Uh, at the time, Professor Kaushik Basu is the president of the International Economic Association, and it's our immense pleasure that he is here with us today to witness the completion of the first full cycle of our partnership from the launch of the call of papers to selection of the winners and the presentation today by the authors of the um, papers, the winning papers. The uh, ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award aims to stimulate the use of innovative empirical research to support evidence-based policies in addressing key development challenges. We face a lot of those. Uh, the award seeks to promote operationally relevant research support knowledge collaboration and help turn innovative research ideas into practical policy solutions. In October 2021, uh, IEA and ADB made the first call for papers with a submission deadline of 31st of December 2021. We deliberately did not place any limit uh, or boundary on topics or themes, but we did point researchers interested in submitting their work um, to ADB's operational priorities particularly on tackling climate change, as the region is currently producing um, more than half of global greenhouse gas emissions, addressing inequality due to digital divide following rapid digitalization in many countries in the region. Uh, third, enhancing regional cooperation to foster um, faster recovery of trade and investment in the region and increasing fiscal and economic resilience post-pandemic. And that's actually even more critical now uh, given what the world has seen in the last few months. On the 1st of January, uh, when we literally opened our email inboxes, we were pleasantly surprised to have received over 250 papers by researchers from across the world. The papers spanned a wide range of topics and themes employing different research methodologies. With such a rich reading list, we could not have asked for a better way to start the new year. Uh, in May 2022, the selection committee met to deliberate on the um, winning papers. The committee included Professor Kaushik Basu, Professor Danny Roderick, uh, Dr. Professor Chatib Basri, former finance minister of Indonesia, and my colleagues from ADB, Albert Park, uh, ADB's chief economist, and Ayako Inagaki, uh, who is the director of social sectors in Southeast Asia. Given the quality of the submissions that we received, I can tell you that the selection committee had a tough job and had their hands full to pick the three winning papers. In fact, the committee decided to acknowledge an additional seven papers as honorable mentions to acknowledge research excellence. The selection committee unanimously felt uh, that the three winning papers employ innovative research methodologies to advance knowledge and support the evidence-based policymaking. The winning papers and the honorable mentions uh, provide fascinating insights on development, and I would encourage all of you to uh, look at them. Let me share a few reflections in the papers, which are grouped into three policy themes. First on infrastructure, the papers highlighted the importance of environment and infrastructure quality. For example, infrastructure investments, uh, 
need to consider the dynamic environmental changes, including on deciding the location of such investments. Second, on social development, the paper has highlighted a range of policy relevant issues. For instance, results from a systematic evaluation show that classroom discussions about gender equality can foster attitudes more supportive of gender equality. Uh, third, on fiscal policy, the papers offer evidence to inform the development of better policies on public expenditures and revenues. For example, one of the papers finds that fiscal rules for subnational governments help reduce operating costs and the probability of deficit accumulation. Uh, in conclusion, let me congratulate the winners of the three winning, uh, the authors of the three winning papers and the seven honorable mentions. I'd also like to thank the more than 250 uh, sets of authors who submitted their papers to the ADB uh, IEA Research Award and the IEA and ADB teams who managed the entire process. My very, very special thanks on behalf of ADB to Professor Kaushik Basu and Professor Danny Roderick, and we look forward to all the presentations and discussions today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ramesh. Next, I have the great pleasure and honor to invite uh, Professor Koshik Basu, Karl Marx Professor of International Studies, Department of Economics at Cornell University, to deliver welcome remarks on behalf of the IEA. Um, Professor Basu, as, as Ramesh had mentioned, was the president of the IEA uh, during 2017 to 2022, and that was when the, the idea for these awards uh, was first uh, uh, came up. Uh, from 2012 to 2016, he was the chief economist of, of the World Bank, uh, so he has um, particularly uh, uh, good insights into uh, where you bridge the, the, the world of research into the world of policy making. Uh, so I'm looking uh, forward to continuing our collaboration with uh, IEA. Uh, so let me turn the floor over to Professor Basu for his opening remarks. Uh, Koshik, the floor is you. Thank you. Joe, Ramesh, Albert Park, the winners of the ADB IEA award, I will not spoil the excitement by mentioning the names at this stage and the other viewers uh, from ADB and associates of the International Economic Association. It gives me great pleasure to be here on this very, very important occasion to celebrate the first ADB IA Innovative Policy Research Awards. I should begin by thanking the selection committee um, uh, uh, with me, Ra Danny Roderick, Chati Basri, Ayako Inagaki, and Albert Park. The work was fascinating, as Ramesh just pointed out, with 250 papers of remarkably high standards. So we had to work very hard to pick the three winners and the seven honorable mentions. When the suggestion for this award came from the president of Asian Development Bank, and I was president of the International Economic Association. The core idea, the credit goes to ADB entirely. But it did not take me any time to jump in and say that we must do it. And I'm glad that Danny Roderick now as president and Elhanan Helpman as the next president of IEA will be associated with this award. You know, um, the world is at a turning point. There was a brief mention made just now about the challenges that we are facing from the pandemic, from the climate change. Every day the news is about floods or droughts and a disastrously worsening climate situation. And there are wars and political polarizations. It's a very, very strange world. But we have seen a world of this kind before. I've been repeating endlessly about the Industrial Revolution, a period that I used to study with a lot of interest. Now it looks like a big gift to humanity, the Industrial Revolution, but it was not so in the beginning. Our productive capacity expanded, but the challenges were huge, a bit like what we face today with the digital advances and other technological advances. Of course, to use the language of economists, the production possibility frontier has expanded, but human interactions have become more complex and there are challenges associated with this. 
We came out of the Industrial Revolution a winner because of the combination of two forces. There were radical policy changes and something that is not pointed out enough, though I have been repeating and writing about it, is that the biggest 100 years of economics roughly coincides with the Industrial Revolution. From Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations in 1776 to Leon Walras's path-breaking book in 1874, roughly 100 years, changed our understanding of the economy and economic policy making. We are in a similar situation and humanity faces a challenge. The, our hope is going to be young minds, innovative minds that join in this very, very exciting venture. Also, we have to keep in mind that as technology improves and computers come in more and take over our mechanical labor out of our hand, the human mind will have to be engaged in creative activity. These awards are a recognition and incentive for not just creative work, but creative work which can be translated into policy. And once again, I will recommend you, as I've been doing to everyone, read about the period of the Industrial Revolution and how dramatically our thought changed and we could take on the environment. At one level, it is a moment like the dinosaurs had faced 65 million years ago, but today, we are the dinosaurs who can analyze ourselves, think of the policies, and these young people who are being recognized for their innovative thinking are being recognized to help us create a better world and take on the challenges. So before I end, let me congratulate you, the three of you who win the very, very deserved prize from a huge competition, and seven of you with honorable mentions, and all 250 of you for participating in this wonderful venture. Thank you, ADB, for having brought up this idea to the table. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Koshik, for, for setting the stage, and also to, to Ramesh for uh, uh, that background on, on where this idea came from. Uh, but before I announce the winners, let me milk the anticipation a little bit longer uh, to give just a little more background on the on the process. So as, as mentioned, we did receive two, more than 250 papers, and they spanned quite a wide range of topics. Um, so the, the, the selection committee had really uh, a, a huge task in terms of, of trying to find uh, what would be the, 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 the top uh, uh, three papers that we would then uh, uh, be presenting today. And so the papers were evaluated on four selection criteria. Relevance of the problem to current regional issues and challenges, um, the structure and presentation, the quality of methodology and analysis, as well as the operational ap ap applicability. Um, so once the committee had ranked the papers, um, they then uh, looked at the top three papers, and those top three papers are the ones that will each receive a, a $7,000 uh, research grant for their work. Um, next slide, please. And so without further ado, I'm, I'm very pleased to announce the, our first award winner is uh, uh, Dr. Claire Balvoni. And she's uh, assistant professor of economics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And her paper is entitled uh, In Harm's Way, Infrastructure Investments and the Persistence of Coastal Cities. The paper provides new insights into choices of infrastructure investments in tackling climate change. Our second award winner, Uh, goes to the paper by Dr. Enrico de Gregorio, postdoctoral fellow in long-term fiscal policy at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and his co-author, Dr. Matteo Paradisi, assistant professor at the IOD uh, Institute for Economics and Finance. The paper sheds light on the audit rule disclosure as an effective instrument for tax authorities to promote voluntary tax compliance. And finally, our third award, uh, is given to the paper by Charlie Rafkin, a PhD candidate in economics at MIT and a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow. Um, his paper was co-authored with Dr. Paul Novosad, associate professor of economics at Dartmouth College, and Sam Asher, associate professor of economics at Imperial College. The paper develops a new measure of intergenerational mobility, 
which points to development policy to promote uh, equal economic opportunity for the poor. Um, so before we get to the presentations, I'd also like to to, to mention uh, some of the other top rank papers. Uh, as I said, the committee really had uh, uh, quite a, a challenging task of, of, of uh, bringing out the, the top papers from a really uh, a quite a large group of, of strong uh, a strong group of submissions. So in addition to the three winners, the selection committee uh, wishes to acknowledge the outstanding contributions to economic policy formulation in Asia and the Pacific of the next rank papers. The honorable mentions include Market Power and Spatial Competition in Rural India by Shimitro Chatterjee, Assistant Professor at Pennsylvania State University, Economic and Political Effects of Fiscal Rules, Evidence from a Natural Experiment in Columbia by Luis Martinez, Assistant Professor at University of Chicago, Road Quality and Rural Economic Development, Evidence from Indonesia's Highways by Paul Gertler, Professor at UC Berkeley, uh, reshaping Adolescents' Gender Attitudes, Evidence from School-Based Experiments in India by Tarun Jain, Associate Professor, Indian Institute of Management. Uh, next, at the right time, Modifying Repayment and Disbursement Schedule in Microcredit by Hisaki Kono, Associate Professor at Kyoto University. Poverty and Mitigation in the Digital Age, Experimental Evidence from Mobile Banking in Bangladesh by Abu Shan Choi, Associate Professor, Florida International University, and Irrigation and Spatial Patterns of Economic Development in India by uh, Aditya Dar, Assistant Professor, Indian School of Business. So I would like to congratulate all of the honorable mentions as well as our, our, our winners today. So, Without further ado, let's hear from the, the winners themselves. And just as a reminder, you can post questions to the presenters through Pigeonhole Live. Um, the instructions were, were given earlier in a slide. Um, so let, first up, we have uh, Claire Balboni. So Claire, let me turn the floor over to you for your presentation. You have 15 minutes. Terrific. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, very many thanks. It's a tremendous honour um, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here to present this paper, which is entitled uh, In Harm's Way, Infrastructure Investments and the Persistence of Coastal Cities. Uh, next slide, please. So by way of uh, motivation, there has uh, uh, throughout history been a global propensity for human settlement to favour coastal regions. And there's a, a very long literature that discusses some of the reasons for that uh, in terms of, for instance, um, uh, advantages for natural transport links, uh, fertile soils for agriculture and so on. So today, uh, if we look worldwide, the five metre coastal zone, so this is the area contiguous to the coast uh, at less than five metres uh, of elevation, contains more than 300 million people, which represents about 5% of the world's population in, in just 1% of uh, it, it, its land. Um, next uh, advanced slide, please. Uh, if we look at the uh, economic history of, of many developed countries, um, uh, however, we see that uh, over, over time, uh, secular trends such as structural change, reducing dependence on agricultural resources, uh, development of the inland infrastructure network and so on, uh, may begin to erode the advantages of coastal proximity over time. Uh, advance slide, please. Uh, and indeed, it's now uh, widely accepted that climate change will uh, introduce significant costs to uh, coastal proximity in the coming decades. So many fold uh, increases in the human and economic costs of uh, environmental disasters projected in the coming decades. Next slide, please. So in this context, the key question that this paper uh, aims to uh, try to study is whether infrastructure investments should continue to favour coastal regions, given what we know about the changing fortunes of coasts. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So in particular, uh, if we uh, uh, look globally, we see that coastal regions continue to attract a, a large and oftentimes even a growing share of major types of infrastructure investments. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on this paper in roads uh, and the density of major roads worldwide in this low elevation coastal zone uh, is about double the global average and this has been increasing in recent decades. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, I will be uh, aiming in the paper to consider whether this uh, allocation is optimal given the changing fortunes of coastal regions. And I'll be doing this in three steps. Uh, I've obviously got uh, limited time today, so I will uh, discuss these uh, uh, briefly in turn. Uh, I will start by developing a dynamic multi-region spatial equilibrium model. So I won't uh, sadly have time to talk through the details of the model, but I'll try to give some sense of the core intuition uh, today. I'm going to then combine this with detailed georeference microdata from an illustrative context. Uh, I will be focusing on uh, road investments in Vietnam over the period 2000 to 2010. And I will be combining these by using the structure of the model uh, together with this data set from Vietnam to estimate the impacts of the realized road investments made in Vietnam over this period, as well as a series of uh, alternative counterfactual uh, road investment allocations of the same total investment magnitude. And I'm going to be doing that both with and without accounting for the effects of environmental change in order to highlight the importance of these dynamic uh, environmental concerns considerations in assessing the returns to such investments. Uh, in terms of the empirical setting, uh, this will, of course, uh, be, a, be a setting that's, that's familiar to many of you. I'll just focus briefly here on the key um, characteristics uh, of my empirical setting relevant to the current study. Um, this is a, a, a context in which coasts are, are of course, uh, very uh, important historically. Um, uh, population, economic activity strongly concentrated uh, in coastal uh, and delta, delta regions. Um, there has, since the uh, 1990s, been a, an inland shift in the, the locus of economic activity uh, that has accompanied drastic structural change as well as uh, rapid development of the inland uh, transport network. This is also a, a region that is uh, highly and uh, indeed increasingly geographically vulnerable. So Vietnam is uh, among the top five countries projected to be affected by climate change worldwide. And to give some sense of the magnitude of that, uh, a one meter rise in the sea level, which is sort of uh, well within the bounds of, of current projections over the coming decades, uh, would inundate about 5% of the land area, of course, much more than that in the, in the exposed coastal and delta regions. Um, uh, and yet this is a, a context where major spatial investments continue to favour coastal regions. As I uh, mentioned, I'll be focusing on, on road investments. I'm going to focus on this period, um, 2000 to 2010, when there was a, uh, a major um, a period of investment in the road network, reaching more than 3.5% of GDP by the end of the period. Next slide, please. Um, so this is showing the uh, map of the uh, Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese road network at the beginning of my study period in 2000, the end of my study period in 2010. Uh, what you can see here is there is a, a strong concentration of those investments focused in these densely populated uh, centers of economic activity along Vietnam's eastern sea coasts and in the Delta regions. Um, sort of the, by way of motivation here, if you advance the slides, please, um, uh, I overlay this with the uh, area um, that would be impacted by a one meter rise in the sea level. And what we see is that these areas that have been the focus of such investments uh, are also uh, strongly coincident with those areas projected to uh, see the strongest uh, effects of coastal inundation in the coming decades. Next slide, please. So uh, as promised, I, I have time only for a, a very brief outline of the models, but I will just uh, talk briefly through some of the, the key, uh, uh, some of its core characteristics while sparing you, uh, sparing you all the equations. Um, uh, this is a, a, a setting where we want to capture the fact that these transport investments, these road investments, uh, lead both to growth, but also to reallocation across space. So uh, the model is going to be a general equilibrium uh, model that allows me to capture these reallocative effects. Um, so I will be using a, a spatial general equilibrium setup following uh, recent advances in the spatial trade literature. 
I also want the model to be able to account for the fact that coasts are in many respects just different. So they have productivity advantages, as I uh, mentioned, for instance, uh, advantages of fertile soils for agriculture and so on. Uh, they have amenity uh, characteristics um, that people uh, attach uh, a value to, to residing in such locations. Uh, and of course, they have uh, trading advantages by uh, virtue of their proximity. Uh, so uh, I will be using a multi-region uh, economic geography model, building on uh, canonical uh, models uh, developed by Eaton and Cortum that allows for heterogeneity across regions, across space in all of these dimensions. I also want to uh, be able to capture the fact, and this is really crucial the, for the question I ask, which is inherently a dynamic one. Uh, I want to be able to account for the fact that roads are, are, are durable. They affect activity today, but also in the future. Um, and uh, uh, of course, importantly, climate change is a dynamic phenomenon projected to be realized over several uh, decades. Uh, and uh, so I, I need to use a, a dynamic setup. And this is something that recent advances in the spatial trade model has permitted. Uh, finally, I, I allow for the model to capture friction so we know that we don't have sort of free costless trade of goods or people. So I'm going to capture that in the model. Next slide, please. Um, uh, the data I will use, so my uh, estimation is going to be at the level of uh, districts, um, Vietnam's uh, second level administrative division. I'm going to be looking then at 541 discrete units, which is sort of a consistent district um, uh, level boundaries over time. Uh, I create collect a, uh, uh, and create a, a, a rich data set of characteristics at that level. So I uh, collate data on geographic features, so land area, elevation, land cover, and so on, uh, population um, uh, and internal migration across those units. Uh, in terms of economic data, I consider both data on the formal wage from the enterprise census, uh, but also on expenditure per capita, um, given the uh, preponderance of, of uh, uh, activity beyond um, uh, the formal sector. Uh, I'm going to use manually digitized uh, network, uh, transport network data on, on roads, as well as inland waterways and coastal shipping routes, um, as well as data on road uh, construction costs. Next slide, please. Um, and I'm going to be combining these two things then to uh, consider the uh, welfare gains from both realized road investments um, uh, and then a series of counterfactual uh, road investments, which aim to answer the question of whether allocating these investments elsewhere uh, could have achieved higher gains. Uh, and importantly, I'm going to be doing both of those things under two sea level rise scenarios. Uh, so the first is approximately what central projections of changes in the global climate suggest is going to happen. So this is a, 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 around about a one meter rise in the sea level. Realized gradually over the next 100 years, I'm going to allow that to affect both land areas and transport costs as land becomes inundated in the coastal zone. Uh, the second is going to be the scenario with no future change in the sea level, which aims to get at how much of a difference it makes to our assessment if we do or do not account for the effects of environmental change. Uh, I'm going to show you the maps very briefly of the counterfactual networks without talking through all the details, but the uh, idea here is to use um, uh, what's called a uh, market access maximizing um, uh, metric. This is a sort of model consistent metric uh, used by policymakers in other contexts, which aims to capture uh, a notion of trade cost weighted uh, economic activity. And importantly, I'm going to be uh, considering a series of counterfactual networks which are uh, uh, comparable other than the extent to which they anticipate future sea level rise. Next, see, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a map I showed you previously. This is what the road network looked like in 2010. And I show you on the right in purple those areas that received uh, upgrades. And again, this is sort of strongly concentrated um, in, in coastal and delta regions. Next slide, please. Um, this is the counterfactual network that maximizes market access. This is an unconstrained maximization without regard to the effects of climate change. As you can see, we would, uh, of course, still see a, a, a strong share of these investments targeting these densely populated centers of economic activity near the coast. But this is uh, somewhat less coastally concentrated than the status quo. And then if you advance the slides uh, in turn, um, the next slides show uh, versions of that. Uh, counterfactual, where instead I maximize market access amongst a subset uh, of areas that uh, increasingly um, 
uh, account for the effects of environmental change by excluding connections to the most vulnerable regions. So this um, excludes connections in those districts that where more than 50% of their land area is above the one meter coastal zone. The next slide um, where that figure is more than 40%, the next where it's more than 33%. Uh, and as you can see, there's a sort of contraction inland of the network commensurate with that. Just in my last few minutes, I want to show you some of the key findings. So if you uh, advance the slides, please. Um, this is uh, showing uh, the results of this estimation of the model in the scenario with uh, sea level rise. So with this gradual one meter, uh, sorry, gradual rise in the sea level towards uh, one meter inundation in a hundred years time. Uh, how I uh, read this is that this is showing us the net present value of the aggregate welfare gains associated with each investment. So for the status quo road investments, uh, we see that with inundation, the net present value of aggregate welfare is estimated to be 1.37% higher than if no upgrades had been made. Uh, we can see there are significantly higher gains under all of these counterfactuals, all of which are less concentrated near coasts. And in this case, with inundation, we see the highest gains to those counterfactuals that avoid the most vulnerable regions. Next slide, please. Um, this is instead showing what the results would have looked like um, in a scenario without future sea level rise. So I can re-simulate the model uh, in a, a a, 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 a scenario where I do not account for the effects of future inundation. Uh, and what this really aims to highlight is that accounting for future sea level rise in the coming decades significantly alters our estimates of the returns to these infrastructure investments that are made today. So if we look at the status quo, uh, we see that in the world with it, without inundation, the estimated welfare gains uh, would have been 1.56% relative to the 1.37% in the world where there uh, we allowed for the effects of sea level rise. And this also changes our assessment of where infrastructure allocations should be allocated. Uh, of course, in the world without sea level rise, the constraint to uh, avoid the inundated areas is irrelevant. Uh, and we see the highest gains to the unconstrained market maximizing allocation uh, in contrast to what we saw in the, the previous slide, which was that in, in a world with inundation, um, uh, the highest gains are to um, those counterfactuals that avoid the most vulnerable regions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just to conclude, um, the central uh, uh, findings here is that accounting for future sea level reside uh, future sea level rise, excuse me, uh, significantly alters our estimates of the returns to infrastructure investments made today um, and assessments of where they should be allocated. Uh, the results suggest higher gains from uh, counterfactuals that avoid the most vulnerable regions uh, relative, relative to otherwise comparable allocations once we, once we account for inundation. Uh, I didn't have time to discuss this, but there's also a very interesting dynamic trade-off, uh, of course, between the long-run gains of reducing that future vulnerability uh, at the expense of short-run costs, uh, and this really highlights the importance of accounting for dynamic climate change and deciding where to allocate infrastructure today. Uh, so again, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, it's a, a great honour and a privilege to be here, and I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you very much, Claire, and, and, and uh, well done with the time uh, covering uh, uh, a complex model in a very clear and concise way. Uh, and uh, very clear in terms of the, the policy advice that you're, you're bringing from your research work. Um, next up, we have uh, Enrique, Enrico de Gregorio, uh, who's going to present his work on audit uh, rule disclosure and uh, for, for tax compliance. Uh, so Enrico, let me turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, being here today. It's, uh, most importantly, it's a big honor. I'll be presenting a summary of audit rule disclosure and task compliance. Clearly here, all views are solely my own and that of my co-author, Matteo Paradisi from AF in Rome. Uh, next slide, please. So the starting point for my talk is really a simple international comparison, or rather what emerges from the international public finance literature. Namely that among all taxpayers' categories, small firms and the self-employed tend to report low levels of compliance with the tax system. So much so that even in countries such as the UK and the United States, more than 40% of the national tax gap is coming from these categories. At the same time, over the past few decades, um, budget-limited uh, or budget-constrained tax agencies have been mostly shifting their resources and their attention 
to enforcing uh, tax rules for larger businesses in expectation of extracting higher tax revenue gains from any single audit with these large businesses. So we would want to survey uh, approaches to tax compliance that in principle incentivize voluntary behaviors for limited costs. So something that's cost effective, in particular for small firms. And to do that, we revisit a common behavior that we see across tax agencies when deciding on who to audit in any given year. In particular, tax agencies confronted with large tax paying population uh, need to devise a set of audit case selection criteria, or as we call them, audit rules, to decide who to audit in any given year. But they keep these criteria to be secret to the general population out of some type of folk wisdom by which the more taxpayers are ignorant about what will trigger a tax audit, what behavior will trigger a tax audit, the less they will be willing to misreport their tax base. So we question this type of folk wisdom, uh, studying a specific case from Italy, a policy case uh, known as sector studies, where it is indeed the disclosure of a given audit rule that is used to try and stimulate tax compliance at a fairly low cost, because in principle, as we'll see, this will be about the communication strategy uh, at the core. And we accessed more than 26 million uh, confidential quasi-tax records, I would say, or files submitted by the small firms and the self-employed over the course of a decade. Next. Next slide, please. Now, um, ex ante, the effect of disclosure on items of the tax base is actually ambiguous. And in order to see this, I'll walk you through a set of graphs. In particular, let's consider that we're looking at the population of small firms belonging to the same sector and region or geographic area for homogeneity. So much so that they perceive some constant risk of undergoing an audit, ex ante, uh, some probability between zero and 100, along a certain uh, reporting margin range. In this case, we're going to be focusing on reported revenues or business turnovers. Next slide. Now, what would happen if the, if the tax agency decided to reveal that taxpayers reporting at least a certain idiosyncratic revenue amount to white hat, they would benefit from a partial audit exemption? Well, this is actually bound to increase evasion among those taxpayers to the right hand side of these thresholds as their perceived threat of undergoing an audit falls discreetly as a result of the audit exemptions. Next. But taxpayers that intended to report uh, below the revenue threshold will now not only feel at a higher risk of being targeted by the policy, but they will also know that if they adjust their revenues all the way to this revealed threshold, they would benefit from a discrete or perhaps substantial decrease in audit risks from the high risks below the threshold to the low risks available above this threshold. So in this case, this would amount to some revenue gains from the perspective of the tax agency. And we have these trade-offs between gains and revenues. Next slide. So we'll try to assess uh, the net effect of disclosure in the case of the sector studies in Italy as anticipated. This policy actually has a long history. It started at the end of the 1990s, and it uh, involves specifically small firms, both self-employed and actual uh, firms of different legal status with revenues less than 5.2 million euros in any given year. Now, the revenue agency at the core of this policy is requesting these businesses to report on their revenues and operating costs or cost of production and structural information uh, every given year. The agency collects this information and estimates sector by sector a presumed revenue function. That is, they're using a statistical model just to predict what is a presumed revenue level that is consistent with the business operation of each taxpayer in any given year. Now, firms might be willing to compare the revenue levels that they intend to declare, actually, with those that the government is expecting from them in a certain sense. And now, interestingly, in the Italian case, they can do so, and this is where disclosure comes in. Every uh, tax season, basically in the spring, the Italian Revenue Agency is releasing a freely downloadable software known as Jericho that helps firms to file in the context of this policy uh, 
but the software itself, upon imputing all the relevant values for the year, will actually compute the presumed revenues for the taxpayer ahead of filing. And now firms might care because the law states that taxpayers reporting at least the presumed revenue amount or more benefit from a partial audit exemption. Indeed, they're exempted from sector study-based audits. So systematically, they will face lower risks above this threshold. Next. And we do see that uh, in the data, taxpayers are pretty aware of that, in that if we plot the relative reported revenue distribution around these idiosyncratic firm-specific thresholds, we'll find a lot of taxpayers reporting at or just above the presumed revenue threshold they're assigned. In any case, on the side of the threshold where the government is promising them with lower audit risks. Next. Now, public finance scholars would look at this type of spiky distributions and try to estimate what would have happened in an unobserved counterfactual where incentives did not change discontinuously. Use the data to estimate such type of counterfactual, specifically in this graph, what would have happened to relative reported revenues if taxpayers had not been aware of the threshold and they would perceive a low audit risk, the same available to them above the threshold in the actual scenario. And we can measure in this way the intensity of what we call the bunching. So the intensity of revenue responses and the anomaly in the distribution uh, given by the disclosed threshold. Now, coming up with measures of bunching is actually very interesting and useful because it allows us to study the correlates of these revenue response behaviors and in particular, we would find that in regions and sectors where average evasion is estimated or expected to be higher, we do find higher bunching responses or a higher level of responsiveness of firms to the policy incentives. So this is most likely a reporting response rather than a real production response. The auditing policy is not affecting real production most likely. Still, these bunching responses could come from either side of the threshold, generating revenue gains or losses. Next. So we will devise basically a model that I'm going to omit, uh, clearly for brevity, to try and decompose revenue gains and revenue losses by really deconstructing firm's choices, estimating audit risks and elasticities or the responsiveness of reported revenues to the marginal incentives for evasion in our scenario. Now, we will estimate these parameters exploiting the rich variation that we have in the data and in the administrative setting we're working with in terms of bunching, local tax rates, as well as differences in enforcement environments for different groups of firms. And the parameters we estimate will be used to reconstruct these unobserved counterfactual scenarios where taxpayers are under secrecy. They don't know the existence or the location of these thresholds. And we do so to show that under disclosure relative to secrecy, mean reported revenues are actually higher by up to 7.7%. So this is again accounting for both losses and gains. And when we ask why this might be plausible and we dig a little bit deeper in the modeling in the data, we're basically finding the following. Um, the audit risk gap that is generated by the uh, threshold revelation of the tax agency is an especially important driver of the revenue gains, while elasticity is more associated to the losses. Now, we're able to estimate in reduced form that the involved elasticities are fairly small, but we have a large amount of bunching, so a lot of taxpayers responding to the policy. So most of this bunching will then come from these audit risks and, the, and thus the uh, revenue gains. Next. Now, this is just about revenues, but all firms have different margins to respond. For example, they could also adversarially adjust their costs so that they can keep the profits or the tax base, if you will, constant. Now, our model was not really well suited uh, to understand margins outside of revenues. So instead, uh, we look at the natural experiment. In particular, we look at the reform to the sector studies that conveniently happens midway through the decade of data that we have. In particular, this reform to the sector studies increased the partial audit exemptions in the law revealed to taxpayers, in particular for the compliant taxpayers. Next. And in this sense, 
this reform is just increasing the revealed implicit discontinuity and audit risks that taxpayers are facing, thus activating the same type of dynamics we have seen before, with some taxpayers willing to reduce their persist innovation and others to increase it. But so we can use this dynamic as the reform was introduced in a staggered manner across sectors to see what happens not just to revenues but now to profits. Next. And what we do observe is that in the period of the reform, treated sectors, again, there's, there's different schedules for each sector, different dates of actual reform of any given sector. But if we take it in relative terms, we see that the post-reform period for these sectors is increasing uh, reported profit up to 16.2% uh, on average over the course of six years of policy implementation we can assess. Next. So this will actually conclude um, and deliver the final message for this presentation. We suggest that this type of study highlight how tax agencies might have a latent policy tool in their arsenal. Namely, they can use signals or a cost-effective communication policy, really, to send out a clear link between reporting behaviors and audit risks in a way the firms can actually understand and act upon, importantly. So this also coincides with a reduction in the opaqueness of the enforcement system as taxpayers start to understand what will systematically change their probability of undergoing an audit. But interestingly, this is also fairly close to what we see in the monetary uh, policy side. For example, if we think about how central banks use, use forward guidance to tell the economy what will be their reaction function based on the state of the economy. In this case, the tax administration communicates how they will behave based on the behavior of taxpayers. Now, this might be especially important in economies such as the Italian one, but often in many middle-income econ middle economies, where there is a large share of micro-level firms. Um, in particular here, the sector studies, by just incentivizing voluntary tax compliance to some extent, were able to raise both revenues and gross profits. And I'm really looking forward to further studies that assess this type of policy in context different from Italy. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Enrico. This uh, really interesting uh, uh, discussion on really the power of, of information in making uh, uh, changes to, to behavior. Uh, let's now turn to our, our final winner. Uh, this is uh, Charlie Rafkin. And uh, the the paper that we're, uh, he's presenting is on uh, intergenerational mobility in India. Uh, so, Charlie, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thank you so much. It is an honor to present this work uh, about intergenerational mobility in India. This project is joint with Sam Asher and Paul Novosad. Next slide. So. To motivate this talk, I'll point out that there has really been an economic miracle in India over the past four decades. And so here in this figure on the horizontal axis, we plot uh, individuals' birth cohorts. And then on the vertical axis, we plot the average years of education attained by each individual. And so as you can see, both men and women have enjoyed a tremendous increase in average educational attainment, where, for example, men's education has gone from about six among the 1965 birth cohort to more than eight in recent years, whereas women have gone from three to just a little bit less than eight. Next slide. And so that figure motivates two potential stories about uh, modern India. The first is that markets might be overturning old hierarchies. So perhaps because India has experienced such tremendous economic growth, caste identities might be becoming less important. There might be political mobilization of mobilized groups and uh, potentially even growing equality of opportunity. And so this motivates articles such as that in the New York Times, like scaling caste walls with capitalism's ladders in India, or uh, in the Times of India about the unexpected rise of Dalit millionaires. Next slide. However, one might also see that there is, in India, tremendous persistence of traditional social structures. So there are high-profile examples where norm violators are punished, even in cities. Uh, India is marked by identity-based politics, and 
potentially persistent inequality. And so for that reason, The Economist might describe why caste still matters, or CNN might write that India's caste system is omnipresent. Next slide, please. And so in this project, we will examine intergenerational mobility, by which we mean the dependence of children's social status on their parents, or something like a notion of equality of opportunity. And I'll be more precise about that in a moment. And to study intergenerational mobility, we first develop a series of new methods for measuring mobility in developing countries, and in particular, when studying education. Second, we'll apply these methods to study, in particular, edu intergenerational educational mobility in India. And we'll derive a set of new results about mobility across time, gender, and demographic groups. Next slide. And so, by way of background, our real objective here is to produce a measure of mobility that separates economic growth from inequality and uh, intergenerational mobility. Now, this is a particular challenge in the developing world because educational attainment is growing rapidly over time, and inequality is really about who is capturing, uh, what are the distributional implications of that economic growth, secular growth, whereas an intergenerational mobility is a notion that is really about conditional on being born in the bottom of the distribution, what are your chances of making it to the top? And so for that reason, outcomes like percent illiterate are less informative about changes in intergenerational mobility or uh, equality of opportunity. Now, another challenge in this setting is that we'll be using education data because in India, there's no such thing as, for example, clean IRS records. And so we'll then deploy an approach where we use partial identification techniques that we developed in a companion paper to bound the expectation of child rank given parent rank, building on work by Mansky and Tamer. Next slide, please. And so just to give intuition about what the problem is, the notion of intergenerational mobility that we'd like to examine is the conditional expectation of child education rank given parent education rank. Now, in our setting, as in many settings in the developing world or in historical data, one doesn't observe very granular education measures. And in particular, we only see seven education groups and more than 40%, and in some cases more than 50% in some cohorts, have the bottom education bin. And so in our case, that's illiterate. Now, given that in this example, 40% of people are illiterate, it's difficult to determine what the conditional education uh, the conditional expectation of education rank given being at the 10th percentile versus the 35th percentile, for instance. And in fact, that can only be bounded. And so we'll be using tools from the interval censoring or partial identification literature to get best and worst case bounds on what the conditional expectation function could look like given a set of data like this, and such that it also satisfies the observed realization of these bin means. And so next slide. For intuition, we'll be developing a set of worst case or best case Mansky style bounds that respect the requirement that the average value within each of those bin gives what you can see in the observed data. Now, this is particularly useful because we can then compute a measure of what we call bottom half mobility, by which we mean the expected average outcome for a child in the bottom half of the education distribution. Now, this measure is intuitively very similar to a popular measure by Chetty et al. called P25. That is the average outcome for the median child born in the bottom half. And bottom half mobility is the average expected outcome for a child in the bottom half. And so these are similar intuitively, but our measure has the advantage in this setting because it can be bounded very tightly using the observed data that we have. And I'll just make a plug that this is something that you can try at home using your favorite data set. We've posted publicly available code that should be very easy to use out of the box. And so our hope is that bottom half mobility can be useful for other researchers who are interested in intergenerational mobility in the developing world. Next slide, please. So the data that we examine is from the India Human Development Survey. This is a household survey in India. And what's useful about it is that men and women are asked about their father's education, even when they've left the home. And so we don't have any co-residency co restrictions. And as a result, we can get a representative measure of intergenerational mobility that links parents and children's outcomes. In fact, we can link more than 90% of men going back to the 1950s birth cohort. 
and 85% of women going back to the 60s cohort. And so because education is static, we can then examine mobility going back about 30 years. This data set also includes useful subgroup characteristics like caste and religion that will allow us to make informative comparisons across group. Next slide, please. And so our first measure is to examine the time pattern of educational mobility in India. On the horizontal axis, again, we have uh, the birth cohort. And the vertical axis is our measure of bottom half mobility. A measure of zero would, be, would mean that uh, conditional on being born in the bottom half, your expected rank is zero. 50 would mean that conditional on being born in the bottom half, your expected rank is 50. So 50 is perfect mobility. 25 is perfect stasis. And zero would be something very perverse. And so as you can see here, uh, the expected sun rank conditional on being born in the bottom half hovers between around 37 to 38 throughout the entire sample period. And this is really striking just because of the traumatic transformations that India has enjoyed over this period. Now, one can compare educational mobility in India to U.S. or Danish income mobility, and we see that it falls quite a bit shorter. And so researchers in this space tend to think that U.S. is far less mobile than Denmark, and the gap between the U.S. and Denmark is, in fact, about the same as the gap between India and the United States. Next slide, please. Now, we can also examine bottom half mobility by gender. So first, I'm just presenting the difference in percent primary completion over time. And so as you can see, the gender gap in primary completion, which is just a measure of uh, absolute outcomes or something like economic growth, has been decreasing over the time. However, uh, if you advance the slide, you can see that despite the reduction in the gap in the primary completion, there's been very little change in the gap in upward uh, mobility between men and women. And in fact, if anything, in recent years, a tiny gap has opened up between men and women of about two rank points. And so the main takeaway from this slide is that despite the, the convergence in absolute outcomes, um, there's been no change in male or female upward mobility over this time period, and the difference between those two. Next slide, please. Our final core result is about mobility across different subgroups. And so again, on the x-axis, we have the birth cohort. And now I'm going to show you a series of uh, these bottom half mobility measures over time cut by different subgroups. And so here we have the forward or other castes. So these are kind of the uh, historically advantaged castes in India. And as you can see, this uh, has remained relatively stable. So it's increased perhaps a bit between 1970 and 1985. However, uh, if you advance the slide, you can see that for scheduled castes, uh, so these are historically disadvantaged castes, but who are still Hindu, you can see that there's been a tremendous increase in uh, their intergenerational mobility, which has gone from something like 32 in the 1955 birth cohort to more than 37 in the 1985 birth cohort. Advanced slide, please. Now, scheduled tribes, who are another disadvantaged category in India, have also in uh, enjoyed a large increase in intergenerational mobility. However, perhaps our most striking finding in the paper, if you advance the slide, is ooh, advance slide, yeah, uh, is a large reduction in intergenerational mobility among Muslims. So while scheduled castes and scheduled tribes have enjoyed a large increase in intergenerational mobility, Muslims' mobility has decreased from uh, about 32 or being similar to scheduled castes to being ranked fourth among these, this group. And I want to emphasize that this is not mechanical because this is conditional on being in the bottom half of the educational distribution across the entire nation. So it would be possible for all of these groups to be increasing if it's coming at the expense of people who are ranked more highly than in the bottom half. Um, but nevertheless, Muslims' intergenerational mobility has decreased over this time period. So as a further benchmark, uh, if you advance the slide, you can see that uh, Black people in the United States have an intergenerational income mobility of 34 while whites have an intergenerational income mobility of 39. And so the difference between blacks and whites in the United States is similar to the gap between the Muslims and scheduled castes 
And it's much smaller than the gap between Muslims and, and forwards and others. And so this disparity between Muslims and forwards and others and Muslims and scheduled caste is really quite dramatic when you compare it against other intuitive notions of disparities of, of intergenerational mobility that we see in this literature. Advanced slide, please. So the paper concludes with some suggestive policy evidence. One that I'd like to draw out a bit is just uh, affirmative action, where we find some suggestive evidence that affirmative action may increase intergenerability. To examine this, we study the quasi-random reassignment of scheduled caste to preferred status, first leveraged by Kassan in 2019. And what we find is that this yields an eight rank point increase in mobility for the scheduled caste who enjoy this uh, preferential treatment via affirmative action. Now, I should note that this is only evidence about the increase in scheduled caste, so we don't know for sure that such affirmative action would work if we gave it to another group. But nevertheless, it's suggestive that affirmative action policies can be powerful in this setting. We also examine other potential factors like fertility or uh, occupations among Muslims versus scheduled caste and find that they play much less of a role. Next slide, please. And so I'll conclude by pointing out that in this project, we use a granular data set and deploy a series of new methods to develop the following results. First is that we find that mobility is flat over time for both men and women. Second, we find a large decline in bottom half mobility for Muslims, while there's been an increase in bottom half mobility for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, particularly among men. But despite their shrinking absolute gender gap, there's been the gender gap in mobility is flat and in fact roughly zero over this entire time period. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlie. Really interesting paper. Um, noted on the availability of, of the code so that uh, uh, anyone watching, if you're, you're interested in tr applying these techniques to your, your, your favorite data set, you know, please take him up on the offer. Uh, I really found the, the, the results that you were showing by uh, caste and religion and, and how similar they are uh, to the, the race differences in the U.S. to be particularly fascinating. Um, so quick reminder that you can uh, add your questions to the, the panelists through uh, Pigeonhole Live. We've already got two questions here. Um, we'll have about 20 minutes uh, or so for uh, uh, Q&A. So let me go ahead and, and start with uh, the first question that we received through Pigeonhole Live, which is uh, for uh, Claire. Uh, so Claire, um, your, your paper looks at really the risks of, of climate change to the, the uh, um, coastal areas. But we have a question coming in saying uh, the coastal areas are also um, uh, particularly vulnerable to, to say, uh, um, tsunamis. And of course, I think we could look at a wider range of natural disasters where the damage tends to be much higher in the coastal areas than in other areas. Is this something that you uh, can bring into the model or have brought into the model uh, or, or is, uh, can think about other ways? or at least run us through what, what some of the implications might be? Absolutely. So it's an absolutely terrific question. Um, yes, uh, there are, uh, of course, a very wide range of projected impacts of climate change, uh, both those projected to be most acutely felt in coastal regions. So, uh, of course, inundation, but as the question asker uh, notes, uh, also coastal disasters. Um, but of course, if we think about uh, the projected effects on, on temperature and, and so on. Um, there are also uh, sort of spatially heterogeneous uh, effects projected in other regions. Uh, on the specific question about incorporating coastal disasters, so the, the central estimates uh, focus on the effects of inundation, where this, this is sort of somewhat um, easier to measure, though, of course, there are many, uh, many caveats to that. Um, in terms of the impacts of coastal disasters, this would be affected to have, uh, I mean, firstly, there's a, a a sort of uh, risk and realization point that it's it, this sort of gradual deterministic trajectory that is um, uh, used in some contexts to think about the inundation trajectory is much harder uh, with events like mm -hmm. these. But what we can do through the lens of the model is to think through some of the projected impacts. So I've had a look at, for instance, if we assume uh, a projected, projected impacts on the productivity values in coastal regions via additional effects like increasing coastal disasters like saltwater intrusion and so on and see what that does to the results. The results are going to be uh, 
um, you know, uh, uh, robust to, uh, if not amplified by changes like that. Um, what the model doesn't have in it is uh, uh, sort of uh, modeled instances of capital being uh, de destroyed by particular um, uh, disasters occurring in particular regions. So there's always scope to improve how we can model these things, but it can accommodate, uh, and indeed I've run some robustness tests to trying to accommodate uh, some of these types of effects that we projected to be uh, important beyond just the effects of inundation. But it's an absolutely great question, and I think a really sort of ripe area for further research, coastal and wider uh, changing disaster risk as, as, the, as the global climate changes. Just uh, from my side, you, your, your paper uses uh, data from Vietnam. Have you been doing this modeling in any other countries within Asia Pacific? So I, uh, uh, in fact, started working on the project um, with uh, some data from India. The, uh, I uh, ended up pursuing this in most detail in, in uh, Vietnam, uh, largely for data availability reasons. So the, the nature of the model and the importance of capturing really sort of granular spatial uh, heterogeneity points to the need for uh, an enormous range of data sets. So I tried to just give some sense right. of that on the slide, but not just geographic features, economic data, migration, and so on, which uh, that, that's a, a, a sort of key constraint often in empirical research, but having those sorts of data sets at all, let alone at a very fine spatial resolution was a bit prohibitive um, in many contexts. So my focus has been on Vietnam where I was fortunate enough to, uh, to collate such data sets, though absolutely the, the techniques and, and, and models Modeling is uh, uh, perfectly applicable elsewhere where such data sets might be available. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Um, the, turning now to a question that we received through Pigeonhole Live uh, for Enrico. Uh, so uh, your, your paper, I, I was <coughs> anticipating that this question was going to come up because, of course, your, your paper is looking at Italy. Um, and uh, we're, we're here in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, what are some of the, the, the things that you would, you would be uh, uh, looking at or, or that we should take away from your, your paper that is really uh, Italy specific? Um, you know, such as often the case with natural experiments is that they, they really apply to a very uh, uh, specific set of circumstances. And what are some of the things that, that you would generalize? Uh, and the question here in particular uh, is, is talking about, you know, greater risks of, of, of rent seeking uh, within developing uh, countries as, as one aspect that would need to be brought in in terms of the thinking. So Enrico. Thank you for your question. And again, uh, for the opportunity, if anything, I was especially surprised to see that my paper would make it to the winning three precisely because it's not uh, a paper from the, the area. At the same time, um, you know, sometimes I joke with my friends that Italy is a more of a developing country in some respects than its neighbors, its close neighbors. And in that respect, uh, I believe that lessons can generalize eventually. Uh, now, I think what's Italy specific is just really the details of the policy. Uh, and often, you know, Italy has a, uh, a passion for making somewhat complicated uh, lawmaking, and this will uh, spills into elaborate systems, administrative systems and bureaucracies. So that's how we, even in the 1990s, we had already come up with a way of collecting data to project the potential presumed revenue level and then use it to communicate it through softwares right. to, uh, to taxpayers. So that was a bit, you know, uh, almost sci-fi back then. But fast forward 20 years or so, I think the digitalization that has affected uh, many countries besides Italy, but especially in the developing world, might really help uh, translating this type of policy into something that's more attuned to the realities of countries in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. In any case, what I think is especially important is precisely this idea that you start off from a situation where the micro uh, business sectors is extremely huge, it's dominating in the economy, and the revenue administration does simply does not have the capabilities to uh, increase audit rates significantly in a taxpaying segment of the population that has a very low level of compliance. So in that respect, uh, trying to guide uh, voluntary behaviors without too much costs on the side of the administration 
is what uh, hopefully I, I would like to see implemented in countries that have similar limitations compared to, say, you know, the United States or Germany that have uh, larger production units. In terms of rent seeking, um, I'm not sure if I fully get the question, but actually, is that on the side of the administration or on the side of taxpayers, you think, Joseph? So are we talking about corruption or are we talking about evasion behaviors to start with? Uh, on that, I, I suppose that would be really part of um, how you would have to to then take these these ideas from the Italian data and understand the context that you're you're operating in 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 whichever country you are then then trying to apply it to. Um, uh, I, for ADB, one of the 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 um, priorities at the moment is trying to help our our member countries to improve their domestic resource mobilization. Um, this has been a, a, it's a top priority for, from President Massa, uh, and we've, we've already started to set up um, support within this group. So here's an area where I think some of your research work would be um, you know, directly applicable. Uh, what I find interesting about your paper is that you're looking at uh, essentially changing the way ins information is given, which is, is a change that can be relatively costless. Um, are there other sort of information-based nudges that you could could think of, either in the Italian context or other contexts, uh, for domestic resource mobilization um, that might be useful for, for uh, countries with relatively low capacity to think about uh, as a way of, of um, complementing capacity development that they're doing in parallel? So this point you're raising is actually, uh, this question you're raising is actually very interesting because in reflecting uh, coming towards uh, this event, I was thinking about you know the, the broader context of how we're approaching task compliance today. And what we've been seeing, especially actually coming from uh, developing countries context, for example, in Latin America, is the idea that you can redesign the incentives surrounding the reporting decisions, either of the taxpayer themselves or the stakeholders to the business, can be employees, customers, uh, what not, but uh, by indeed providing incentives, potentially even rewards. So you could have tax lotteries, you could be raffling some type of reward. Uh, as an administration, what you can do is promising a better treatment to some extent. So for example, speedier uh, bureaucratic processes for those who seem to be more compliant than not. So actually the, in the Italian case, um, the natural experiment I was showing was actually the juncture point between the original policy that I was studying, the sector studies, and the current system that we have, which is really disclosing a full set of compliance indicator to the taxpayers, providing increasing levels of rewards or benefits based on the, the level of basically compliance course, indeed. Um, so this suggests that there can be a radical shift in the relationship between taxpayers and the government in terms of encouraging the, the compliance decision, which is eventually what sustains the whole public budget. Uh, thank you very much, Enrico. We've got a, a question here coming in from Pigeon Hole Live uh, uh, for uh, Charlie. Uh, it, it, it was, uh, the question is, you know, what are some of the insights on uh, some of the reasons for the notable decline in mobility of, of, of Muslims? And what are some of the policies that, that you would uh, suggest uh, to try to reverse that trend? Thanks. So I think this is a really important question. Um, I don't think that the paper has a smoking gun for what the explanation for the decline in mobility for Muslims is, and I think it's an important area for future research. What the paper does try to point out is that uh, affirmative action could be one potential useful policy for intergenerational mobility. So to expand on this a little bit, uh, in the end of the talk, I pointed to a section of the paper we, where we have, you know, I think useful suggestive evidence where we deploy this natural experiment that uh, Kassan developed in 2019, where there's a set of scheduled casts who, refer, who obtain preferred status in the middle of our sample period. So there's a change mm -hmm. uh, in affirmative action policies for some scheduled casts. It only occurs in some regions. And so you can imagine this lends itself to kind of a two-by-two two right. type uh, design. 
And what we find is that for the scheduled castes who newly uh, obtain affirmative action, they enjoy an eight rank point increase in intergenerational mobility. And so, you know, if you take that literally, what it would suggest is that if you were to give similar preferred status to Muslims, it could close something like two thirds of the gap. Now, I think that would be kind of extrapolating that local evidence pretty far mm -hmm. for Muslims. But, um, you know, the point is that this that this policy seems to be quite successful for the scheduled castes who receive it. And uh, it's at least one sort of reasonable type of policy that could potentially assist Muslims in India. But as for what you know caused the decline in the first place, I think it's hard to say. There's a number of uh, economic and political factors that could have caused it. And I don't think we want to speculate, but that's one policy that we at least think is promising. Um, you know, I think it's a natural experiment where I think it's at best suggestive just because um, we can only look at fairly coarse uh, groups here. So it's a two by two design where we're limited just based on who's exposed to the policy. It's not quite as sharp as we'd like to be able to make something, you know, stake our, our hat on that. But I think, uh, hang our hat on that. But I do think that it is a useful, a useful policy to explore further. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, Charlie. Just, uh, I guess, moving away from the, the specific questions of the, uh, uh, the, the, yep. the caste and, and, and religion uh, and the differences in mobility there, but just in, in terms of thinking of how flat the mobility trends have been, um, are there a, a set of policies that would uh, try to improve those, those trends in mobility um, and, uh, you know, in particular, is there some sort of sequence that we should be thinking about, um, it, it, you know, a government with, with limited capacity to, to implement, uh, a number of, of measures simultaneously? Are there some that, that, that should precede others, uh, in terms of policies that would be, uh, supportive of intergenerational mobility? It's a, another great question. So I think... Um, in these types of intergenerational mobility papers, what the literature typically like tries to do is look at, you know, at a local level, what are the factors that can predict intergenerational mobility? Uh, and then, you know, if you're really lucky, you have access to natural experiments where you can say something further. So I think what we try to do in the paper is look at different regional correlates of intergenerational mobility, which at least speak to potentially promising policies that could be helpful. And what we find is that infrastructure investments um, and local capacity, so primary schools, uh, tend to predict having higher intergenerational mobility. Now, you know, I, I'm not, I think that there's reason to think that those are not causal evidence, but I think. Um, mm -hmm they're at least interesting, useful, descriptive predictors. And so it suggests that, you know, while mobility and development clearly are um, not inextricably linked as, as, you know, evidenced by the fact that India has enjoyed such rapid growth without having a change in mobility, it does suggest that the more developed places do have more, um, have higher mobility. And so, you know, those those correlates could be could be useful to explore, but we don't have, you know, uh, school construction program. We don't examine a school construction program, for example, uh, and see whether that changes mobility. Mm -hmm. Those would be the types of evidence that I think would be useful for answering that question, and we don't have that in the paper. Okay, uh, great. Charlie, thank you very much. Um, so I, I just got a message from my, my, my colleague, uh, uh, the Chief Economist Albert Park, uh, who is saying uh, he'd like to, to, in fact, shorten his own closing remarks so that we can stretch our, our discussion a, a bit longer. And I've got a, a question that's come in here from, from Pigeonhole Live. Um, uh, which is more specific to, you know, uh, I think, let, let me pose it to all of the, the, the presenters, which is, um, you know, are there any thoughts on the policy implications for ADB's own uh, uh, regional and sectoral program priorities? So something that you would, you would not necessarily be giving to policymakers, but something that we might suggest to ADB in terms of, of our own support to, to, to governments. And, and, and Claire, I think you may have the easiest task because ADB does a lot of financing of infrastructure. Uh, but what are some of your thoughts in, in, in terms of how we might think of our, our financing approach um, uh, uh, based on your, your research outcomes. Claire? 
Yeah, I, th I mean, it's it's a great question. As as you say, there's uh, the, the the sort of obvious um, uh, financing implications that that make this question perhaps slightly easier for me. But I, I would also say, sort of uh, uh, complementing uh, this, as you know, is sort of tragically uh, evident by. Uh, as demonstrated by recent events, there are there are many many areas where, um, um, in, in within your program, regions are sort of uh, acutely exposed to these types of uh, uh, climate uh, projected climate effects, and I, I think there's also a really important role here for. Um, uh, building accurate climate change projections, building the evidence base on uh, how adaptation uh, might ameliorate some of those effects. And this, you know, my, my focus is, of course, on, on infrastructure location, and um, uh, and that's uh, an important part of this. But uh, there are many other kind of infrastructure policy policy decisions. So thinking about adaptive infrastructure uh, and so on. So I think about financing across that uh, spectrum as as being very important and thinking about this uh, this set of issues. Uh, of course, as came up in the earlier questions, I, I'd also sort of uh, highlight the importance of, uh, of considering also the other manifold effects of climate change that are projected beyond just uh, coastal inundation, coastal disasters to, to think through the range of kind of temperature, precipitation, frequency and severity of natural disasters right. across areas. And all of those uh, uh, really point to the need for uh, uh, more uh, uh, research in terms of the projections, uh, our understanding of the potential impacts of adaptation. Uh, and yes, uh, then um, uh, financing across both the types of infrastructure and the infrastructure decisions that I focus on, uh, but also thinking more broadly in terms of infrastructure and other uh, investments that might help uh, exposed economies to adapt to those effects. Uh, thank you, Claire. And, and this might be my bias talking coming from the research department, but I, I really liked your focus on uh, the uh, primacy of, of gathering more uh, and better data in order to, to, to make these decisions, um, that, that, that any data gathering we're doing really becomes a regional public good um, that, that can uh, uh, spread beyond whatever costs that were coming. Uh, Enrico, uh, as I mentioned, uh, domestic resource mobilization and particularly um, this establishment of uh, a, a do domestic resource mobilization resource center for Asia and Pacific has been you know, one of our, our, our key points. What's some of the advice that, that you would say is coming out of your research that we should be thinking about in terms of more, more, more broader support that we could provide our developing member countries? Uh, Enrico, I think, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Great. Sorry for the for the break. So I'll also basically make myself my life my own life easy uh, this time around, precisely because we've been mentioning uh, data collection, IT strategies. So I think the ADB should really push in that sense. Um, countries to really strengthen the link between tax administrations and citizens or taxpayers precisely by developing the IT infrastructure. Now, on the administrative side, it's really about uh, developing statistical capacities and capabilities. Um, this will definitely come with digital records and establishment of good IT systems within the administrations, both to study the data and then to carry out enforcement based on what the data is suggesting. And now we're in a huge wave of machine learning approaches in task administration. So that should definitely be encouraged to develop risk-based assessment. But on the other hand, uh, it's really also about dealing with the digitization levels of the private sector. We want people right. to access you know, simply computers and very easy, understandable softwares. This would actually uh, come also through the encouragement of uh, tax literacy, really. So teaching mm -hmm. people how to keep accounts, how to report accounts. And at that point, when the uh, connection between tax administrations and citizens is really established, then we can have credible tax enforcement and reactions on the part of taxpayers to tax compliance policies. So when that link is established through the IT systems, then messages can really travel across and policies can really have bite at low cost. Okay. 
Uh, thank you very much, Enrico. And, and finally, let me uh, bring it back to, to Charlie. Again, the, the, the same uh, question to you. Um, you know, uh, thinking of your research, not so much about what you might be uh, uh, applying for the, the government of India, uh, but how you would uh, advise ADB to use this research when thinking about its own, own programs. Uh, Charlie? So I have uh, a similar, per perhaps unexpectedly, I have a similar call as uh, Claire and Enrico, just because I think, you know, we're, we're all self-interested. And so promoting the importance of uh, data collection and, you know, building up data for, to do research, I think is especially important in uh, the context of intergenerational mobility, just because the data demands are actually quite large for uh, intergenerational mobility. And part of what the paper tries to point out is that in developing countries, examining intergenerational mobility is quite difficult because you need parent-child mm -hmm. links. And, you know, right. when, so you're either limited to kind of boutique household surveys where they ask uh, parents or children, or you're limited to kind of co-resident parents. Uh, and especially with, um, you know, often in, in, Parts of India, people move out of the house quite early, and so it makes it difficult to examine uh, intergenerational mobility. And so part of what especially Paul and Sam have been doing over the past decade is working with the government of India to develop um, high-quality data sources that economists can use to, to give uh, advice for developing countries. And so, you know, I think that work has enabled this particular project as well as a lot of other work that they're doing. Um, but I think that there is lots of room for additional financing in, you know, not just India, but all other member countries to build up data capacity to do this type of uh, work. So I think we know very little about intergenerational mobility uh, in the developed world because of these data challenges. And so, you know, first documenting the descriptive patterns, and then um, once those are documented, looking for naturally occurring sources of variation to be able to answer more clearly some of the, the questions that I had uh, Ray had, had been asked, I think, um, you know, it would be really helpful if this to, to further explore this problem. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Charlie. And thank you, Claire and, and, and Rico, and Rico uh, also for, um, first, for your clear presentations of, of your work. Um, I know if we dig into your papers, one of our, our criteria was the, the rigor of the methodology um, and, and that often uh, would be, uh, 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 you know, quite complex, quite a lot of, 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 uh, of, of um, uh, quite a lot of math to, to wade through. And yet, you've been able to to take all of these and bring bring them out in a very intuitive way. So I've been very pleased about, at how um, this this process of our our inaugural awards has really uh, uh, essentially achieved what we were looking for: is how do you bridge that gap between rigorous, high quality uh, uh, research work that, that is policy relevant, but being able to, to bring those policy implications home. Uh, um, and so we're looking forward to, to building on what we've been able to do with these inaugural awards uh, for future awards. My only regret is that we weren't able to do this in person. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to, to future awards where we'll be able to make these presentations at the ADB annual meeting, uh, hopefully next year when we're, we're in Incheon. Uh, so uh, we're coming to a close now. So let me now invite my, my colleague, uh, Chief Economist uh, uh, Albert Park, um, who heads our uh, Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department, um, to just say a few closing remarks and to also uh, let everyone know about the 2023 ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award call for papers. Uh, Albert, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Joe. Uh, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, I just want to start by saying uh, it was a real pleasure to serve on the selection committee. There were so many excellent papers. And I want to, again, congratulate uh, Claire and Rico and Charlie and all of their co-authors uh, for uh, winning this year's ADB IEA Innovative uh, Policy Research Award. Uh, the presentations were great, but they really scratched the surface, and I hope you'll have time to read the papers carefully. It's, it, it was a real pre pleasure to read them. So today, as Asia continues its recovery from the pandemic, the region faces many challenges related to disease, war, weather, social and political polarization. And these, of course, compound long-term challenges, 
including inequality, learning poverty, climate change. And against this backdrop, it is more critical than ever for policymakers to rethink and try to be more creative and think out of the box in designing policy responses, but ones that are backed by rigorous uh, research. Um, uh, this, of course, also calls for ever closer collaboration um, among governments, academic institutions, civil society organizations, international financial institutions, and all stakeholders to come up with innovative solutions to these rapidly evolving development challenges. The ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award serves as a collaborative mechanism that aims to translate cutting edge economic policy research into effective policy formulation and ADB's operations in order to address the development challenges in Asia and the Pacific. And uh, can we please put up the slide announcing uh, the competition for next year? So it's my pleasure, my final task here before we close, uh, to announce the call for papers for the 2023 ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award. And as was noted earlier, uh, the award aims to promote the application of innovative empirical research in economics to support evidence-based policies in addressing key development challenges in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, so let me just uh, point out that there is no restriction on topics or themes. Uh, ADB, ADB's operational priorities include but are not limited to tackling climate change as the region is currently producing half of global greenhouse gas emissions addressing inequality due to the digital divide following rapid digitalization in many countries, enhancing regional cooperation um, to facilitate faster recovery of trade and investment in the region, and increasing fiscal and economic resilience uh, post-pandemic. Uh, for next year, the selection committee will include five distinguished scholars from ADB, IEA, academics, and policymaking practices these include uh, Ramesh Subramanian, who you met earlier, the Director General of our Southeast Asia Department, uh, Ms. Chashin Hu, the Deputy Director General of our Research Department at ADB, Ms. Allison Booth, Emeritus Professor, uh, Research School of Economics at Australian National University, uh, Haroon Borat, who is a Professor of Economics and Director of the Development Policy Research Uni Unit at the University of Cape Town, and Carl Kendrick Chua, the former Secretary of Socioeconomic Planning, uh, National Economic and Development Authority of the Philippines. So there's no restrictions on nationality, gender, or fields of expertise. Research from any country may apply, but policy solutions must be relevant uh, to an ADB developing member country. We especially encourage young and female scholars uh, and researchers from universities, think tanks, and academic institutions to apply. Uh, each of the winners, uh, just like this year, will receive a $7,000 grant financed by the ADB. The top three papers will present, be presented at the uh, awards session at next year annual meeting, uh, which will be in Incheon. Uh, ADB intends to do its best to apply the ideas generated by the award-winning papers to its operations um, and in its policy advice to member countries. Uh, the submission portal will be posted on ADB's website and social media starting September 28th, uh, and the deadline uh, for submission will be December 31st. So we look forward to your continued support and contributions to the ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award in 2023. And so with that, uh, thank you for uh, attending this very interesting and stimulating session, and uh, wish you all uh, a very good day.